So, uh, so this evening we're going to hear from each of the 19 2013 Youth Associates and they'll tell their stories and share their experiences with you. Um, now, of course, it's worth mentioning, as, as many or all of you know, that, that these guys have just returned from six months of, of uh, living and working overseas. And so they're still uh, processing and making sense of their experiences. Uh, and so I really congratulate uh, you guys on, on being able to take the unique moments and experiences that you've had and transfer some of them to us in, in a few short minutes tonight. So well done in advance, and I'm really looking forward to it, as, as I know everybody else is. We're delighted that, that Cody is a, is a family. It's a network of over 6,000. I think we must be getting close to 7,000 graduates in 130 countries. And by leaving this program successfully tonight, uh, we, you, you become part of that network, and we welcome you again to the Cody family. As you can tell, we were all in very different countries and a huge part of our experience was learning how to live and work in those new cultural contexts. So the first theme we'll be talking about today, as Adam mentioned, is cultural integration. Uh, for me personally, a huge thing I had to adapt to was how to navigate Lusaka. My primary mode of transportation was these minibuses. And when you're looking at the photo, you're probably thinking, that doesn't look that bad. But on average, the conductor would have 25 people in that bus. So the seat you think should be holding three people actually has five on it. Um, what was interesting about that, though, is it created a real sense of camaraderie between all the riders. It was entirely normal for people as they were navigating those really tight spaces to put their groceries, their purse, their laptop, or even their baby on your lap. There were a few times when it got to be a bit much. I remember multiple occasions where I had livestock plopped down on me, ranging from a chicken to a goat. <laughs> but ultimately, what I remember the most about public transit in Lusaka is the sense of community that was so clearly exhibited in everyday life and was such an important part of being Zambian. When I first moved to Ethiopia, I was determined to learn the language. I wanted to be able to interact with my colleagues and neighbors with ease, and I didn't want, think it was fair to expect them to accommodate me by only speaking English. So I hit the ground running and signed up for Amharic lessons when I arrived, Amharic being the national language in Ethiopia. I kept a notebook full of words and phrases that I learned from my colleagues. And I started out with, hello, salam no, which was pretty easy. Uh, thank you, I'm a Saganaldo. Took a, bit, a little bit longer to sink in, about a week maybe. Um, after about a month, I could count to 10, but then I got a bit caught up with the greetings. It wasn't as simple as a quick, hi, how are you? There appeared to be an infinite number of ways that you could ask someone how they're doing. And just as many ways to respond. And it was pretty common to use any, anywhere from one to all of them within a single interaction with every single person that you meet that day. Um, so it, w it became a bit confusing. Every morning I would walk into my office, determined to greet my co every single colleague in Amharic, only to have them throw me off with new words I didn't know how to respond to. I kept looking for the formula for these interactions, but the more words I recognized, the more confused I became with the whole situation. Six months later, sad to say I never really became fluent in Amharic, <clears throat> but I picked up enough to get by and became really good at trades. Um, but what really happened is that I finally realized the full scope of what I was trying to accomplish there. Ethiopia actually has 80 different uh, indig indigenous languages, and I really started to realize that just like any culture, language is complex and fluid, and there is so much more happening beneath the surface than what's just being said. One thing I did learn, however, is, was how appreciative Ethiopians are, were sorry, of the few things that I did know how to say. I learned how proud the people were of their culture and their heritage, and how, ha how happy it made them to see an outsider show a genuine and respectful interest in their way of life. Everyone, this is the Masakane Gym. In Hosa, it stands for building each other up. This is where the gospel was spread. It did not have anything to do with religion, per se, but they found something to believe in. Harm work and determination were the pillars of strength. We did not have up-to-date equipment, let alone lights, for two months, so we worked out with kerosene lanterns. But I had never seen more dedication to achieve a goal. The floors were being destroyed by the weights. 
and there was no money, so we got old tire treads to make up a rubber flooring. I found what community and integration was truly about when I started there. I was hesitant at first, but there was support across the languages, and I was not willing to quit with that much motivation surrounding me. I helped renovate the gym, and they said their thanks through teasing, through encouragement, and through personal success and failure. The location of the gym gave local benefits to the surrounding areas such as protection, to the neighbors, gardens, and a sense of community justice. If you were a criminal, it was not the best place to cause trouble. As you can see, the gym did not only give adults a place to hang out, these children would give the thumbs up, the wink, and a shop shop booty when we would be on our way to the gym. The gym also allowed an increased sense of security when I was walking through the townships and between the schools I worked at. On my way to work, I often would meet a few of the guys, which was comforting because it was a familiar face and I could trust them to help if I ever needed it. The gym also changed my romanticized notions of good and bad. I knew some of the individuals who had served prison time when they were younger, and I was surprised to see how well we connected as friends despite their past. I started to think about how they had grown up in the apartheid era and why toughness and self-worth mattered so much. In Hosa, there is a term that we would use to describe the other men at the gym. The term meant our land, and to a fuller extent, Africa as a whole. The irony of this is that most of the guys were built like Africa. They had large upper bodies, but they did not have the same base, much like Africa. Ease way. Like many of my peers, I found cultural integration very challenging, especially when you stand out. So one of the tools that I used to try and fit in and adapt myself to fit into the culture was observing. Two things that I observed within my first couple days in Guyana was that their status and their sense of time are completely different from here in Canada. Status is completely important to the Guyanese culture, and they do different things to show their status. For example, the height of the person's heels, if they have long, fake nails or toenails, the way their hair is designed, if they have a designer bag, and the way that they're dressed. I came into work the first day, and I thought to myself, wow, I'm really going to have to put a little bit more effort in. Called my mom and asked her, how do I iron my clothes? <laughs> the second thing, time. That was something that I really had to get used to. They have this thing that we call Guyana time, and people are always coming just now. So on our first weekend, we made plans with one of our friends at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock rolled around, no one was there. 12 o'clock, I got a text saying, I'm coming just now. We eventually got together around 3. So I got used to Guyana time. Anytime I knew I was meeting with someone, I'd bring a book, uh, have an activity, make sure I had a friend, because I always knew that someone, was, would, or someone would be coming just now. Um, I'm going to tell you about one of my interesting experiences. I got to live in a small village with a chief, his five wives, and 40 children. Um, I've only saw 28 children at one time, so I don't know where the other children were. They might have been at school, they might have been in somewhere else. I didn't really know. <laughs> Um, but it was really eye-opening for me to live with a family that was so different than my own. For instance, most mornings we'd wake up, I'd have breakfast with the chief, then I'd have breakfast with one of the other wives, and then I'd go work on the farm all day. In the nighttime, I spent my time in the local store watching Nigerian soap operas and drinking palm wine with my house brothers and the local villages. <laughs> I got really hooked on Nigerian soap opera called Billionaire's Club. And I bought all the DVDs before I went back. <laughs> Cameroon is an absolutely beautiful country. I was really lucky to spend most of my time in Bamenda. Bamenda has all kinds of like little hills. And being originally from Cape Breton, it made me feel quite at home. Like It reminded me a lot of the Cape Breton highlands. But even more beautiful than the Cameroonian landscape were the people of Cameroon. I've never met a group of people that were just so nice and welcoming. Everywhere I went, people would say, you're welcome. And everywhere I went, people would want to feed you, and feed you to your heart's content. It got to the point where I'm going to have to go to the gym a lot now that I'm back in Canada. Um, and one day I tripped. I, was, I tripped and I twisted my ankle really badly. About seven people ran up to me. One carried me into their store. Another ran to get a cold drink to put on my ankle. And a third ran to a pharmacy to buy some drugs, which I don't think they sell in Canada, but they worked really well. <laughs> 
Um, in Bemenda, most people spoke pidgin, so it was a mix between English and local dialects. My favorite word in pidgin was ashia. It basically means I'm with you, but it can also mean various things from I'm sorry to I feel for your, bad for your troubles or I'm here for you, but the biggest meaning of it is that I care. And that, that word was probably used about 20 times within my day-to-day -day life. So it just shows how much Cameroonians care about each other. And the people from Cameroon welcomed me into their hearts and to their homes and their hearts with open arms. I'm, I'm grateful to have met so many inspiring people, and I can't count the Cameroons I've met, some of my best friends. Up in that photo is three of my house brothers, um, Tilton, uh, Clement, and Frederick, and uh, my, the other interns I went with outside of school. Um, returning to Anakinish, which is a second home to me because I went to university here, has made me realize that I've become a different person as a result of my experience, hopefully for the better. So I'm going to end this talk with something, a quote that describes my feelings from the late Nelson Mandela, who was a hero to me. And although I did not go to South Africa like uh, Blake and Logan, I'm just going to state his quote, which says, there's nothing like returning to a place that, rem that remains unchanged to find the ways in which you yourself have altered. Thank you. And when I think of community, firstly I think of the Ethiopian localities and neighbors that provide for each other in such a beneficial, sorry, such a mutually beneficial and gen generous way. I think of the women who arranged themselves into marketing groups that provided them with more leverage and better bargaining power at the market. I think of men holding hands and drinking beer as they showed at the football screen and elders tightly gathered into a small coffee ceremony. When I think of community, I think of the kids that lived on my path and would wait for me every day around 5.30 when I came home from work and charged towards me, eager to play baseball, football, or jackpot. <clears throat> when I think of community, I also think of my NGO's community, a community that welcomed me with opened arms and helped ease my transition into Ethiopian life by teaching me um, passionately their culture, their customs, and their religion. I think about the times that we did chat in the back of the car on the way to the field, or they wanted to have me over for, uh, for drinks or to in introduce me to my ch their, their children, um, or give me these lovely Ethiopian dresses like this one. <laughs> um, when I think of community, I also think of the expat community that I entered. Um, as, a, as a Canadian abroad, voluntarily or involuntarily, you become a member of the Ferengi, foreigner class in Ethiopia. You're treated with an intangible superiority um, regarded as experts in most every situation and subjected to the Ferengi premium, um, ridiculously incongruent taxi prices and suspiciously high market prices. <clears throat> um, although this class was very comfortable and comforting, I found, most, I found myself happiest when I was able to erode those invisible bar barriers that separate you from your local community and really make myself a part of, of the Ethiopian communities I was a part of when I played jackpot with the children or cooked shiro over a wooden, wooden fire. Um, but my experiences with community aren't necessarily the norm. Um, as you'll find out, our, uh, the other interns had you know, very different experiences in some cases. So when Kate and I arrived in our placement in the village of Machudi in Botswana, I was definitely hoping to be a part of the community there. I wanted to connect with the locals, I wanted to familiarize myself with the faces there, and I was really hoping to feel at home. But this ended up not really being the case in our village. It was pretty difficult to fit in, in a village of about 44,000, when you're really the only white-skinned Lakoa that lived there. So I was really a little bit worried about my time there. But um, it just felt like we didn't fit in. The landscape was dry, everything was too hot, so I was a little concerned. But I was really happy to find that I found community in a pretty unlikely place. Um, we were really lucky to work at Stepping Stones International, which is an organization that works with vulnerable or orphaned youth aged around 12 to 26. And the goal of this organization is to help youth reach their potential so that they can be successful in their own lives. And although I wasn't expecting it, it was here that I ended up finding the most important sense of community and where we felt the most uh, welcome and at home. 
Um, I found that Stepping Stones was a great community in two really great ways. So first of all, the after-school program, which caters to about 70 youth each and every day, uh, was a phenomenal place for children to come and find a support system and a safe space with each other. So despite the challenges that these kids would face day in and day out, they could always come there and find an incredible solidarity with one another. So it was quite amazing to be able to witness that, and the kids really did steal my heart when I was working with them. And secondly, there was an amazing sense of community with the staff that worked there. Um, all the people that worked at Stepping Stones were fantastic humans. And for one example, Tsepo, he was uh, someone who, on the day that he found out he had a job at Stepping Stones, he quit his job. And although he lost a much bigger salary and a comfy office where he had space and he didn't have children tapping on his shoulder day in and day out, when he came to Stepping Stones, he became Uncle Tsepo and was a hero to the kids that he worked with and uh, in some ways was the only family that these children had or the closest thing to it. So it was, I was very lucky to be a part of that community overall and I was so grateful that they welcomed us so warmly when we arrived there. So although in our village we could never really toss the label of foreigner or outsider, um, we were just really lucky to have a space that we could go to and it was something else to be able to witness people championing each other day in and day out. Um, so I really miss it already. It was the most rewarding work that I've done so far. Okay, so I was in northern Ghana and during my time there, um, one of my tasks was to research and document women's SUSU groups. So SUSU groups are kind of like village savings groups. So they're groups of about 10 to 20 community members who regularly contribute a small amount of money um, to a collective fund. And members can take out small loans from that fund when needed, and they pay it back with a small interest. SUSU groups are pretty cool, and they have a lot of benefits. Um, for example, the groups are completely community-owned and organized, and they're not, um, they're not heavily influenced by outside institutions. When I visited a women's SUSU group in the village of Bengbe, I couldn't help but notice the incredible sense of community. And I think Dr. Gaventa and Vicky Schreiber would be able to attest to that as they were in the same village. Um, the women came together after a long, hard day of working in the hot fields. And they were singing, dancing, laughing, and just being goofy. And the joy I see from this picture just is so heartwarming. And it's just, it's really amazing. Um, SUSU provides women with a safe space to come together to share experiences and talk about life and their families and their financial concerns. My field visit to Bengbe really showed me how valuable and important a strong community is. And the learnings from this experience will stay with me for a long time and will influence how I interact in my own community. Thank you. So I was in Guyana. Um, Guyana is a warm, welcoming country filled with sunshine, which is a really a reflection of the Guyanese people who are really welcoming, warm, and friendly people who are just really want to get to like get to know you and know and know where you're from and if you're like enjoying your time in Guyana. Um, the things that I really took away from or that I'll always remember about Guyana is the small friendships that I made. Um, for example, I met a man named Nigel. This is actually a picture of his workshop. And so I would walk past his workshop almost every day on my way to the grocery store. And so it started off and Nigel would wave to me and I'd wave to him. And um, just because everywhere you go in Guyana, people are always saying, good morning, baby, like, good afternoon. Like, how you doing? Just want to get to know you, right? And so one day I'm walking back with my backpack and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to like go up and talk to this guy because I see him all the time. So I'm like, hey, I'm Carmen. What's your name? So he tells me his name is Nigel and he shows me around his workshop and what he's working working on, he's building some kitchen cabinets. And so that's how our friendship kind of began. And then every day after that, when I'd walk past, he'd wave and like, hey, good morning, morning, Carmen. Like, what's going on? And I'd be like, hey, buddy, what's going on? And so in September, he beckons me into his workshop and he's like, Carmen, when are you leaving? I need to make you a gift. And I was like, Nigel, man, don't worry about it. I leave in September, or November, the end of November. So mid-October, I'm walking past again, and he, he waves me in, and he presents me with this pencil. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man. So it's made out of crab wood, crab from the crab tree. Um, they actually extract the oil, um, and they put it on their skin. That's kind of another story. Um, 
but yeah, so like this will, this pencil, it will always remind me of Nigel and just of the others, like random friendships that I made on the street. For example, a lady named Karen, um, she would sell newspaper on the street and I would see her every morning at like six o'clock in the morning. She was right by the seawall and I'd wave all the time. And there was another lady, Betty, at the market who would sell me apples and she had family in Canada and we'd talk about that. Or there was a man who sold pineapple out of the back of his van. He had this like strange straw hat and he would like, I gave him a hug one time and he kissed me on the neck. Like I'll never forget these things, you know? Um, <laughs> Like other things about Guyana that I'll never forget is just the small things that made me smile. Like every day you're walking around and there's two people riding on a bike together, for example. Like a dad and daughter going to work or to school or um, a couple riding home from the grocery store. Just two friends riding around in the afternoon liming, as they would say in Guyana. Um, another thing that made me smile every time on the public bus. You're riding around so fast and the bus driver's playing music so loud you can barely think. But then Usher Confessions Part 2 will come on and like everyone will start singing, like forgetting all of their troubles. Like It was amazing. And it's the times like that to just... Guyanese people were just so eager to welcome you into their community and I'll just never forget the warmth that no, not only like the climate in Guyana but the warmth of the community. In addition to being breathtakingly beautiful, Tanzania is one of the most hospitable countries in Africa. Jambo, Habari, Karibu, and my favorite, Freshi. These are all the greetings one can expect just walking down the street. Coming from a fast-paced Canadian culture, I really appreciated the genuine acknowledgement I got from my neighbors and the people around me. And, uh, sorry, I'm a little sick. Um, and I think that being part of the various communities um, in Dar es Salaam is what made my experience unforgettable. Working with Access Africa, I was brought on to mobilize informal savings and loans groups like this um, to be able to access formal financial services with small community banks. So from talking with these women, I learned the value of resilience and financial prudence and Ketange fashion. <laughs> um, and professionally, I was invited in the community of bankers and financiers of small community banks who were looking to expand their services to these previously overlooked groups. Though it was pretty overwhelming at first to be in the company of such distinguished people. That experience taught me to be observant and determine different stakeholders' interests. As a result, I was able to better perform my job and expand my professional community. Even on a personal level, I was fortunate enough to make lasting relations with so many people, both from the local and from the expat communities. Um, they say home is where the heart is, and I can honestly say it broke my heart to tear myself away at the end of my six-month placement. Um, yeah, it was really sad. <laughs> One of the greatest lessons I learned was that the access I had to many of the communities was because I came from a place of privilege. Being aware of this, I think, is uh, really important for anyone working in development. And now, the next group will talk about this theme of privilege. Thanks. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and think of yourself for a second as a child. You arrive at school and you sit on a wooden bench with four other students. When the teacher asks you to copy down notes, you have trouble writing because the bench is too crowded. The windows in the classroom are small, so it's too dim to see the board properly anyways. When the teacher begins to read aloud, you can't follow along because only four kids in your class of 60 own textbooks. Take a second and think about how you would perform on a test in this situation. Now open your eyes, look around you, think about where you are, think about the kids you know and where they go to school. It's probably quite the contrast. I confronted these contrasts every day in Cameroon. I taught in an overcrowded classroom. I bathed in cold water from a bucket every day. I applied to teacher's college and realized what an obstacle limited internet can be. Around months five and six, I began to find myself thinking, I'll wait to distribute that document until I have fast internet at home. This water is cold, but in four weeks, I can have a hot shower. After a particularly frustrating classroom experience, I might even have thought, I only have a few more sessions in this school. And that's when I realized, 
Privilege is having access to other options, having access to mobility and to choice. If my Cameroonian peers want to apply to school, they don't have the choice of waiting until the internet is faster. When my neighbors want a, a hot shower, they still have to boil water. The kids that I worked with will spend their entire school career in that type of classroom environment. They manage and overcome these challenges on a daily basis. I can be proud of myself for adapting to a different style of life, but I should never forget that part of my capacity to adapt is based on my capacity to leave, my knowledge that I chose to be there and that in my life, these situations are temporary. So I should never forget that there are people who don't have this option, that it's an example of my privilege and that not everyone shares that same privilege. Most importantly, I should never forget that there are people facing, overcoming, and working to change and challenge these circumstances on a daily basis. So my question is, how can I support them? Thank you. I would describe myself as a pretty avid runner. And so when I arrived in Hyderabad, I was thrilled to find that I was living near a park where I would be able to continue one of my favorite activities. I'd wake up at 5.30 every morning and go running in the park, past the peacocks in the cooler morning air. When my colleague told me that there was a Hyderabad marathon late August, I didn't hesitate to sign up for the half, and I quickly started my training routine. The week slipped by, and before I knew it, it was late August, a Sunday morning, 6 a.m., and I was running through the empty streets of Hyderabad. There were no crowds out there to cheer. Running really isn't that much part of the culture there. But there were individuals out and about on their morning routines, looking at us out of curiosity, probably thinking we were kind of crazy. I think maybe we were. But I had always thought running was a really accessible activity. You know, you really just need a pair of shoes, or maybe not even those at all. There's a big barefoot movement these days. But somewhere out there, around uh, perhaps kilometer 17, I started to really realize running is quite the privilege. It's a privilege that I could pay the entry fee to that park that I trained. It was about 10 cents Canadian, and it offered me safe and clean pathways as a female, away from the traffic and the stray dogs of a city of 8 million. It's a privilege that I could afford the entry fee to race in that marathon. It's a privilege that I had excess calories to burn, a privilege that I could get sweaty and dirty knowing that I had a shower and a clean set of clothes waiting for me at home. It's a privilege that I could get tired because the rest of my day would be set, spent in an office kind of setting and not doing physical labor. It's a privilege that I had time each day to do something that I really loved. This is, that was the full realization of what was privilege. So on a dry, dusty afternoon, I found myself in the back seat of Oxfam Canada's SUV 12 hours south of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. We were headed to a community visit. <clears throat> when I first complained of an upset stomach, one of my colleagues cracked a joke. Enjoy the free African massage <laughs> as a result of the bumpy roads. Upon arriving in the town, or the community, excuse me, um, I did my best to pretend I felt fine, blaming it on mere car sickness. So I took my place under uh, the shade of a tree where I would take uh, notes for the discussion that was going to happen. <coughs> Unable to focus, I had to excuse myself, and uh, unfortunately my breakfast made a reappearance. <laughs> um, so it was definitely a circum uh, an unwanted circumstance, but a uh, uh, memorable one, to say the least, as a camel sporting a USAID pack watched the whole thing happen. <laughs> I don't share the story to evoke sympathy. Rather, I share the story because as we left the community, we passed a clinic. One of the Canadian colleagues who was with me asked why I hadn't been taken to this clinic. The answer? The clinic was empty and insufficient for what I needed. In my foggy state, sitting in the front seat of the car, trying to hold myself together, um, the conversation that I overheard continue was that the number of clinics all over Ethiopia did not translate to rural access to health care. Many of these clinics aren't kept up or are insufficiently staffed. At the end of the day, 
I still found myself not feeling so great. But lying in the hotel room, I couldn't help but wonder what would have happened if one of the women I was with earlier that day was in my position instead. I laid there thinking that the next morning, I knew I would be driven 12 hours back to the capital, where I would have access to many modern hospitals and medications, all of which would likely be covered by my insurance. The privilege I hold had never felt so apparent. Well, we have just heard about the hardships that privilege presents in our daily lives abroad through a, through a variety of, of different stories. Um, it being clearly a challenge we all faced and were forced to incorporate into our roles and placements, privilege does not solely manifest itself in our interactions and experiences. I saw privilege as access to opportunities previously unavailable to the communities that I worked with. I saw privilege as access to prayers and... Or, I saw privilege in the prayers and faith in God which my community shared and that they would trust would be provided to them. Privilege in accessing health care for even the poorest individuals. Privilege to attend school and higher learning. Privilege in having food, water, and shelter. Privilege in their commitment to helping one another. An example of this being Mandela Day in June um, to celebrate his birthday and commitment we went out to a garden and helped an individual suffering from AIDS um, to establish her larger garden. As well, privilege in democracy. I ventured out under the impression that I represented a privileged lifestyle and that I was going out to experience the other ways of life. And at every turn, I was rebuffed. My community, regardless of the local circumstances, still spoke of how privileged they were in their lives. They spoke of television shows that they'd watched a long time ago in their youth, um, and World Vision would, would spray across infomercials about Ethiopian starving children, and that still resonated with them. It was worse off in those places. I talked to these people about growing up in a life with so little, but a land of so much. Life is difficult, a daily struggle. However, they felt privileged to be South Africans. They felt strong in what they had and where they had come from. With a history of stru struggle and oppression, these are now the good times, the times of freedom. I thought I was privileged, different. The people I met thought the same exact thing. These are the reflections uh, and insights we've all gained, and I would now welcome the last group up to present their ideas. So our final theme this evening will just be some collective insights and reflections that we had. Obviously, we all had incredibly different experiences, but there were many common th themes that ran throughout all of our six month placements overseas. Beautiful. So, in the beginning, our coworker would come into our office around 8 a.m. to open the door. After connecting the internet and checking the email, her day would finally begin. Scanning for new funding opportunities, helping with the NGO's active programming, searching for new programming opportunities, and managing the other team members usually consumed the majority of her day. Her evenings would be spent editing budgets for proposals, connecting with other civil society organizations, and of course, taking care of her family. She is our coworker, our supervisor, and she is our friend. She is also a volunteer, as were all of the other staff members at the Youth Outreach Program. While living in Bemenda, Cameroon, there were many passionate people that surrounded us, passionate about their families, friends, God, and their work. Working within an organization which hosts only volunteer employees was an interesting experience, but it brought to light one clear fact, that despite all other things, people would not be in the office if they did not care to be. The passion held for something which is ingrained so deeply that a paycheck is not your motivation for getting to work every morning is a beautiful, oh, pardon, is a beautiful thing. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Though there is no replacement for a paycheck, you need a livelihood to provide yourself for, and for your family. Full-time volunteers made it apparent a fact that I know will forever carry with me. That is the importance of passion in your work. The ability to be able to fully dedicate yourself to your passion and still make ends meet in your home life, and that is an undeniable skill. The more genuinely and deeply you care for what you are working towards, the more fulfilling journey you will have and more satisfying the final outcome. 
Money doesn't buy happiness, and that is something that we all learn and have had the opportunity to witness firsthand. Hopefully, this personal experience is something that will continue to be present in the forefront of our minds. Every morning for the past three months, the first thing that I would do when I'd wake up was it'd be, I'd pick up my phone, not checking for messages from friends or family, but rather checking for security updates as to whether the office is open today or if I can even leave the house. This is due to the political crisis in Bangladesh in the lead up to the upcoming national elections. The political impasse has resulted in nationwide strikes, blockades, and mass protests, which, which often result in fatalities and property destruction. Well, this posed a challenge to me in my everyday life, getting stuck in the occasional small rural town in, in Bangladesh. It does not compare to the destructive effects it has had in the everyday lives of Bangladeshis and to the country's wider development objectives. Many Bangladeshis re rely on day labor as their primary source of income. A strike means that they cannot work and therefore cannot feed their families. This exposes many households to further vulnerabilities. From an education standpoint, the countrywide shutdowns have forced schools to close, just, uh, depriving children of their right to education and preventing students from taking university entrance exams. Furthermore, the increasing number of blockades has disrupted supply chains, resulting in soaring food prices and bare shelves at grocery stores. Indeed, these factors have eroded the social cohesion of the society, threatening the stability of the country. These examples are context specific, but are not limited to Bangladesh. The transition to a stable democracy is a challenge that many developing nations face. While the current outlook for Bangladesh does look quite bleak, these elections present an opportunity to address these challenges, to reconcile differences, and to proceed along the path to democratic consolidation. The perseverance I witnessed amongst the people of St. Vincent throughout the agriculture sector was contagious and inspiring. It's difficult to comprehend what exactly I've experienced over the past six months. It has been a whirlwind of experiencing a different culture, meeting incredible and passionate people while building relationships, as well as bearing witness to the great potential that exists within the agriculture sector. In my time in St. Vincent, I was working with organizations that focused on developing sustainable markets and livelihoods for local farmers. <clears throat> agriculture in St. Vincent is faced with a number of substantial barriers. In the not so distant past, agriculture was slavery. It is a great obstacle to break the slavish mentality of colonial indoctrination that it still exists in some of Vincentians. Generally speaking, producers of agricultural commodities within the region are mainly aging smallholders with a lack of resources. They face significant challenges in terms of improved technologies, technical support services, financial assistance, and accessing formal markets. As a consequence, most young people do not perceive farming or the agriculture sector as a viable occupation. In an attempt to persever persevere through some of these barriers, my organization hosted a regional workshop aimed at increasing participation of youth in agriculture. Over 50 participants from 14 Caribbean countries came together to collaborate. The main focus of the workshop was to articulate a common policy position, including concrete recommendations for an enabling environment for youth in agriculture. Through collaborative small group discussions and presentations of case studies, ideas were shared and creative and innovative recommendations created. Overall, the workshop accomplished what it, was, what it intended to achieve. Another mechanism deployed by the organizations I was working with was the promotion of labor clusters in order to cooperatively resolve challenges hindering development, such as high costs and limited workforce. Farmers themselves worked together to share labor within their clusters. These swap labor programs have shown great success. Case studies have shown that when this method is util utilized, profit margins have increased 90 to 100 percent, which is a huge success. Based on the people I met and the perseverance I witnessed, I feel more confident in achieving my goals and dreams. Over the past six months, I had the incredible opportunity to witness resilience every single day as a part of the Stepping Stones International family. Arriving at Stepping Stones, I was so excited to do whatever I could in, to help in any way, shape, or form. Excited, 
nervous and trying my best to adapt to a new culture, a new temperature, and, trying, oh, and a new life, I had question after question running through my mind. What if I can't bond with the kids? What if I stay an outsider? Will they share their stories with me? Will I ever be able to understand their lives? Very quickly, I realized that kids are kids. They want to learn. They want to play. They are meant to thrive. They might need comfort from time to time, or a listening ear, or maybe just some compassion. Yes, these kids had hardships. Yes, some of them had past so awful, I still can't bear to think about. Some don't have a stable home to go to. Some don't have a safe home to go to. Some are the sole providers for their families. Whatever their challenge, as awful and as heartbreaking as it was, it was their reality. But, as I said, they were kids, and at Stepping Stones, they could be kids. Happy, silly, smart, funny, inviting, warm kids. The atmosphere and support provided within the Stepping Stones community allowed them to leave all of their insecurities and their worries at the door. They were in a safe place that fostered their growth, and working with the youth, I found myself inspired every single way possible. For the past six month, months, sorry, I was a personal witness to the incredible growth and unimaginable openness. I had the chance to connect with youth who, despite their daily obstacles um, <laughs> that, come, that came to the center every day with contagious smiles, with hopeful spirits, and wicked dance moves I will never be able to learn. <laughs> Between the months of June and, well, actually for most of my placement, I spent a lot of time in the field. I was living in a village of about 6,000 people in rural India, in, a, in the state of Rajasthan. We were working mostly with small and marginal farmers, that is, people who you would consider in many cases to be the poorest of the poor. Marginal in the sense that usually they were in the most excluded sections of society. They were the widows, the scheduled castes, and the scheduled tribes. They were the people who had less than a hectare of land, usually unirrigated, usually without access to utilities such as electricity to gain that vital irrigation if they had a source. Every day I would, well, not every day, but a lot of days, I would, cli <laughs> I would climb onto the back of my coworker's bike and we'd go out to work with these farmers. My coworkers would do agriculture extension activities. They would talk to farmers about emerging technologies, different things they could do in cultivating soybean, different ways of growing, different ways of using fertilizer. And, well, I wasn't very much help because of the language barrier, so I did data collection. Uh, and I did a lot of data collection and a few interviews as well. Um, and something that emerged in that data collection and something that emerged from what my coworkers were talking about is the risk that these farmers were taking on. Now, in Canada, farming is a risky business, and in India, it's risky as well. But the small and marginal farmer, he is the most adverse, he or she, we're talking about everybody here, is the most adverse to risk. Uh, any small risk, using a new type of fertilizer, using a type of seed treatment that kills his crops, one failed harvest, and he's done. He, maybe he, his kids won't eat the next year. Maybe he won't have enough money to even sow his crops. So risk is a very important part, for, uh, very important issue for the small and marginal farmer. So, and we're asking farmers to take these risks. We were asking farmers to take really big risks. And, and how do you ask farmers to take really big risks? Well, I think the main, the main issue there was hope, because the farmers, they were hoping for a better life. They wanted to improve their livelihoods. They were hoping that you know, their kids could go to school next year. They were hoping that maybe they could have a TV, like the richer guy down the road. There's big hopes and small hopes, you know? And while we were confident in our da data, Agriculture is not a sure thing, just like any business. You don't know if the market's going to turn out well. You don't know if the weather is going to hold through. So we were hoping too. And I think that hope and risk are the two lessons that I really took away from it. <laughs>